Hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to the New York Public Library, whether you are here in the Burger Forum with us or joining us virtually. And we do have quite a robust um, online presence this evening, maybe because people were scared away by the weather. But thank all of you for coming out on this somewhat chilly February evening. I'm Martha Hodes. I am serving as interim director of the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers. Before we begin, um, please be aware that this event is being recorded. We also um, encourage anybody who would like to, to wear a mask. If you don't have one and would like a mask, you can just raise your hand and we'll come around and give you one. For virtual attenders, real-time captions are available by clicking on the closed caption button. Or for a live transcript, um, you can use the stream text link shared in the reminder email or chat. Well, this evening we continue our wonderful lineup of um, conversations from the Coleman Center, presenting Coleman Fellow Melinda Mustakis, launching her new novel, Homestead. Why not applaud? <laughs> Lovely. In conversation with the distinguished writer, Danielle Evans. If you have an NYPL library card or if you live in New York State and would like to apply for one, you can borrow Homestead for free. You can also buy the book from the library shop and proceeds do benefit the New York Public Library. You can find links to buy the book on the events page at nypl.org slash conversations. Or best of all, you can buy the book right outside the Burger Forum after this evening's program and have Melinda sign it for you. Allow me to say just a few words about the Coleman Center. We select 15 fellows each year who come to the library to gain intensive access to our unparalleled collections in order to write what we like to call the books of tomorrow. Our fellows are, on the, are among the best and most promising, academics and independent scholars, fiction writers and poets, journalists, translators, playwrights and artists at work today. Writers and scholars from any country are welcome to apply and you will find the application for the next cycle of fellowships on our website in June. You can also see everything the library has to offer by signing up for our newsletter at nypl.org connect. All programs are made possible by the generous donations of patrons just like you, so please do consider supporting the library however you can. And now to tonight's program. Our speakers will converse for 35 or 40 minutes and then take your questions. For those of you here with us, please use the card and pencil you found on your chairs to write your question, and program staff will come around shortly before Q&A to collect them. If you're joining us online, please share your question either in the chat or by emailing culmancenter at nypl.org, and please be sure to do so during the program. Once Q&A has started, we're not able to monitor the questions. And now to this evening's guests. Melinda's interlocutor this evening is Danielle Evans, author of The Office of Historical Corrections, named a Best Book of the Year by The Washington Post, The New Yorker, Kirkus, Slate, BuzzFeed, O Magazine, and Glamour, among others. She's also the author of Before You Suffocate Your Own Full Self, a National Book Foundation Five Under 35 selection, among many other prizes. Danielle has also published in the Paris Review, Best American Short Stories, and she received her MFA in fiction from the Iowa Writers' Workshop and currently teaches writing at Johns Hopkins University. Danielle converses this evening with Melinda Mustakis, author of Bear Down, Bear North, Alaska Stories, winner of the Flannery O'Connor Award, and also a five under 35 selection by the National Book Foundation, among other accolades. Melinda's work has appeared in Granta, The Kenyan Review, and American Short Fiction, among other venues, and she's a winner of the O. Henry Prize. She's also the recipient of fellowships from the Lewis Center of the Arts at Princeton University and the National Endowment for the Arts, again, among others. Melinda was the Rona Jaffe Foundation Fellow at the Coleman Center in 2017-18. Tonight, we are thrilled to launch Melinda's debut novel, Homestead. Today is the book's official publication date. <laughs> Very exciting. Melinda was born in Alaska, and that's where the novel takes place. The New York Times calls it engrossing, spare, and exquisite, 
tough and lovely, expansive and staggering. In a starred review, Publishers Weekly singles out the book's wondrous descriptions, writing this evocative account of Alaska's American settlers is so convincing it ought to come with a pair of mittens. And Kirkus calls Homestead nuanced and suffused with poetry, writing that the author excels at conjuring place. You can feel the wind and taste the homemade cherry wine. So good. I can't wait to hear more. Please join me in offering a warm welcome to Danielle Evans and Melinda Mistakis. Hi. Um, thank you so much for this beautiful introductions. And thank you so much, Melinda, for this beautiful book. Um, it's really an honor to be here talking to you about it. Congratulations on Publication Day. Thank you, Danielle. So we met as five under 35. Um, nominees. We will, we will not say how long ago that was. We are now at the no. age where you should not ask us how old we are. <laughs> but we met in New York, so it's so lovely to be back here together. Um, yeah, and I, I'm going to cheat a little and ask you a first question, um, which I think will also get us the treat of hearing a little bit of this beautiful book. Um, you've written the book in these this perspective that it has to encompass two people who are not always great at communicating to each other and have very distinct views of things. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you arrived at that point of view for this book, um, and then maybe treat us to a little, a little bit of the voice so people will follow along as we're talking about the rest of the shifting. So structure was really important to this novel. It's the only way I could think of, of how to um, write about 300 pages of two characters who are strangers meet in Anchorage are quickly engaged and married, like my grandparents. So this is loosely based on my grandparents. And um, Lawrence, as a character, is not very communicative. And Marie's very young. And they don't know each other. And they spend their first winter living on an old school bus, which also my grandparents did, being homesteaders, um, waiting for spring to come to build a cabin. and. Um, the book is also in present tense, which is another challenge. I don't know if I'll ever write another novel in present tense, and we can talk about that. <laughs> it had to be, but um, that was another challenge. But um, so, so structurally, I knew I wanted the two points of view because in thinking about wilderness literature, there's the trope of the lone man in the wilderness, and I thought, I really want Marie to have a perspective so that I landed on, I want it to be able to switch back and forth. And the other idea was I didn't want it to be in first person, and I don't know why at first I decided that, but I think what ended up happening is the third person sort of um, z zooms in on their thoughts and perspectives, so it's third person limited. And also, I found as the book progressed that the voice itself, that it seemed a little more omniscient than I thought at first, and it, I think it becomes the voice of the landscape, of, of the homestead itself, actually. Um, I'm not gonna say it's the voice of Alaska, I think that's oh, a big overreach, but it's one voice of this landscape. And so um, I, think, I think all those things ended up working together. And do you want me to talk about how the, chapters progress and move? That was um, another decision. I want to talk to you longer about structure in a second. Okay. So maybe we can talk. Let's, do you want to read a yes. little bit? And yes. then maybe let's talk about the movement. It's a good idea. <laughs> so I'm just going to read the first paragraph of chapter one. And the book actually starts with Lawrence's perspective, which I actually didn't want to happen. I wanted it to start with Marie. And I'll read it, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is, but so you could just get a sense of the um, style of the novel. And then I'll read the first paragraph of chapter two, which is Marie's perspective. So chapter one, Pioneer Peak, June 1956. God made the trees, and men make the kindling, they say. 150 acres of white spruce and paper birch, alder, aspen, cottonwood, and willow. Spears of evergreen pointed at the sky and the pale and peeling bark and the leaves of every branch, all for the taking if the acres are proved. Fell the trees and clear 20 
acres of land to seed a crop, raise a cabin with nails and timber, and weather the seasons. This is the way to earn and own the deed. So this is Lawrence's perspective. And actually, so the first line of this book is based on something my grandmother said. Some years ago, I went, we went out to the homestead and I asked my grandmother about her early days um, homesteading. And her, you know, just from her perspective as a woman, what it was like, um, how she viewed the wilderness, all those questions. And she said a version of this first line, it may be exactly, but maybe the tenses are a little different. And that line just stayed with me. And so for a long time, it was Marie's line. And um, it, you know, when you're working on a novel, sometimes you have to let things go. So it was more fitting for Lawrence. He's older, he knows what he wants. He's sort of uh, fixated on homesteading in Alaska and getting the deed to the, hun to the 150 acres. And so that just sort of fell into place. And I'm going to read chap beginning of chapter two, uh, which introduces Marie. Chapter two, Moose Lodge, July. There are scores of men in Alaska, their faces a worn stare, and the first man Marie likes the look of who has prospects and could be tied down long enough to marry, she will have him. Visiting her sister and brother-in-law, Sheila and Sly, all the way from Conroe, Texas, with the money they sent and no return date, she walks with them into the Moose Lodge and mouths open and forks hang in the air. Talking to Sly is a way to be closer to her, be a big man, and offer what before was a hassle, a favor to have hers. Marie laughs too much and too easily, the charm of being the shiniest thing in the room, and sips her beer to be polite and to avoid the swarm of do-gooders if her glass becomes empty. Two women at a table are collecting signatures for the support of statehood. Now that there is an Alaska constitution, this should follow. And one talks about how Alaskans should be able to vote for the president and for their governor, who currently is chosen by the president, which is just not how things should be done. We're taxpayers, after all. So I wanted to introduce Marie, and not only was she fixated on getting married as a means to stay in Alaska because she's on this visit, but I wanted to bring in this idea of land already with the Alaska Constitution, so it just wasn't like that she only thought about getting married. I wanted her to be fixated to on land from the very beginning. And so I think the landscape binds them in terms of point in terms of the style of the of the writing. Thank you so much for that. It's so lovely to get to hear this book in your voice. Um, so you are one of my favorite short story writers. And one of the reasons you're my favorite short, one of my favorite short story writers is because you have this capacity to sort of fit a whole landscape into a short story. I think a lot of people, when you ask them, well, you know, you write so many short stories, why did you move to the novel form? They say, well, because I needed these multiple characters, or I needed these multiple threads, or I needed these multiple points of view. But you are like a magician, and you can do all of that in a short story. So I'm wondering for you, what made you know that this project needed novel room? And what, as you were sort of working out the structure and had that expansive space, did you decide to prioritize spending it on? What was that sort of shift from writing in this beautifully compressed form to this more sprawling form like for you? I think it was a challenge to myself to say, oh, I could write a novel. And the collection, Bear Down, Bear North, is a linked story collection. So in scope, it felt novelistic. And I think at one point I thought, well, I could have just called it a novel in stories and, uh, and marketed it that way and maybe made it a little longer. But for this project, this is not the book I ever planned to write. I don't, books sort of pick you, I think. And there's a book I've had in mind for a very long time that I still haven't written. And this one sort of took over and it really surprised me because it's about suddenly being married and I don't really know anything about being married. <laughs> and I wrote a whole novel <laughs> about it. And, but I think, I think the real question is in, in, in thinking of marriage that the real mystery is what makes a good marriage. I think we all can imagine what makes a bad marriage, and so that's what I sort of focused on, is a tumultuous marriage. But in terms of structure, um, I, I didn't know for the longest time. I rewrote and rewrote the first chapter over and over until I thought I had gotten it right. And um, the story of 
Lawrence the homesteader going out and not having the map to his land is actually based on a story about my grandfather where he, I think he lost the map. There's a difference in the book of why he doesn't have the map, but he couldn't find his, his land and he came across a helicopter had seen him and they call, you know, they call him a tenderfoot, which is a term of, you know, why are you out here? You're a newcomer, you don't know what you're doing. And he found his land by lift, being lifted up in a helicopter. And so this like bird's eye view and getting that perspective was really important. So I had the first chapter sort of crystallized in my mind. But to move to the second chapter was, I didn't know, it seemed, as if I was going to make an impossible leap for a long time. And then I sort of decided that I wanted each chapter to move forward a month. And that was so crucial to this novel and thinking that it could be a novel because I was very uh, frightened for a long time that this would not be a novel. And I did think, you know, I, I love short stories too. And by the way, you're one of my favorite short story writers. <laughs> This is, we're just going to compliment each other. <laughs> Y'all can go. We're, we're good. <laughs> and so that, that question of I, if I moved forward a month each chapter and I focused on a couple of days and I really wanted this book to be immersive. I, wanted, I love books where you as a reader, you sort of stop reading and you have to like shake yourself out of this other world. And so I wanted it to be very immersive. And so that was the other thing of thinking... With a short story, it feels when you're beginning to write it that you're sort of, you just jump into a, a lake and you have to figure out how to swim to the shore. But you can always see where you're going and you know there's land. In a novel, it's as if you're being thrown into the ocean and there are sharks and you just think, this is not going to happen. And um, I, so I wanted the challenge, but the structure really lent itself to a novel. And then um, when I first began writing pages, they were very messy, it was about 75 pages. And I sent them to a reader, um, Sergey, and Sergey said, you have about three novels worth of material here. What's the first novel? What's the first sort of condensed amount, of, like a, a set amount of time that you could write about? So what happened is with homesteading, there's all these criteria that you have to fulfill to get the deed to the land, and one's, one is living on the land for um, a number of years, building a cabin, planting, clearing land, and planting a crop. So then I suddenly thought, oh, I have the set amount of time. It's to get the deed to the land. And then I knew you know, what I was working towards in terms of the novel, but it was, it was Oh, the other, the other choice, too, was when I mo counted the months, I knew that when I would get to the end at some point that there would be 40 chapters, and I just thought, that's such an elegant number, and I was about to turn 40 <laughs> in a couple years when I was mm -hmm. <laughs> eventually, as I was finishing the book, I thought it sort of coincided, so that's just a funny coincidence. Yeah. But all those sort of structural questions, it was as if, you know, I kept writing towards what I thought would be a light, and then things would sort of fall into place. But I didn't plan it, but I ended up with, I think, a very elegant structural structure for the book. Yeah, there's also an elegance to the fact that because you're going month by month, there's a point at which they have to account for any time they've left the homestead, but we've all also, we also have to account for that time. And so it was interesting to me when I read, read it the first time that we start kind of in Alaska, like, Marie has just gotten there. She's determined to not get go back. She's going to find a man. Lawrence is going to find his land. Like we're we're ready to go. But then the the next couple chapter takes us back to um, Minnesota for this wedding. And so there's it was interesting to me because we had so this momentum in Alaska, and then we had to sort of see the difference between that landscape and another place. This sort of much more domesticated family setting, which was also tense in its own way. But before before you sort of strand these people in this sort of very isolated space, they have to sort of go into the thick of a family dinner in this sort of farmland and take a road trip away from where they're going to live. Um, and so I wondered if how you thought about sort of that movement and balancing the movement away from the homestead with all of the time they spend kind of just together in that one space. Were those, those moments that they travel, are those 
deliberate breathing spaces? Is that just a way of saying, saying okay, well, they have to have a wedding, so we, we need to see the wedding to see the rest of the marriage? Um, but I wondered how you made those choices of like when they were allowed to leave. So the wedding, I had actually been teaching at that time, and a student turned in a story where they didn't show the wedding, and I caught myself, and I said, why wouldn't you show the wedding? There's, you know, you, you, get, you see so many dynamics of the family. Um, people are often not behaving as they should. Everyone loves to see an event. So I went back and I actually expanded the wedding section. Um, and I actually had a friend who, I think I was at her wedding and didn't notice, but she caught her veil in the candle and that singed veil stayed with me. And I thought, oh, this would be the perfect time to use that image. Don't when invite I writers to weddings. <laughs> 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 yeah. And so that image stayed with me. And then I thought, well, this would be the perfect time to, you. she doesn't, Marie doesn't know Lawrence, and she's already agreed to marry him. So that they would go, and she, she let her sister and brother-in-law come and um, I think anytime Sheila and Sly are in the book, it is sort of for relief, it's for communication, it's for Marie to talk to someone that she's known her whole life and talk about you know what's wrong with between her and Lawrence. So I, I guess I after saying that to that student, I was like, I'm not following my own advice. I need to write this wedding scene, but it was it was a way to you see you see Lois, Lawrence's mother, you see his family. You see more about him because she doesn't know him. So it's a way to get to know Lawrence and see where he's come from because you're not going to get that anywhere else in the book. So it, it sets up a lot. I think that chapter is one of the longest in the book. It's a, maybe a little unwieldy, but I thought it was really important to show those things. And then by the end of that chapter, they're, they're back in living on the bus and they, go, they end up back on the homestead land in Point McKenzie. Um, so, and it was, you know, I, honestly, it was a chance to burn the veil is my <laughs> short answer. Yeah, and then there's, and this is the last plot point I will give away, which I think is early enough in the book that I, it, you, you probably, if you've read any of the beautiful reviews of this book, you already know that yeah. um, there's a kind of abrupt tonal shift kind of early on in their marriage that, you know, there's this kind of giddiness to the beginning of the marriage. They've sort of just met, they've decided to get married. They're sort of in it together to, to claim this land. Um, and then Marie has this terrible miscarriage and, it kind of it isolates her from herself, from Lawrence, from her sister. Um, there's a real kind of palpable grief that she stays stuck in for, for a while. And because we're going chapter by chapter, we sort of are in it with her for a minute. And so I wanted to talk about how you calibrated that tonal shift from that sort of giddy forward motion to that grief and stillness, um, and how you thought about that sort of the kind of labor she's doing as as she comes out of that grief or, or learns to live with it, I don't know if she ever entirely comes out of it. Um, there's, we get to that scene and, and while she's sort of still processing that, there's a callback to the wedding where um, Lawrence's father shows up with like a photo that was taken and it's already feels both like so outdated and like she can also see things in it that she didn't see at the time even though we saw the whole day with her. Like it's changed their marriage that quickly and it all happens pretty quickly after their, after their wedding. So I wondered if you could talk about that movement into the grief and how you thought about kind of writing through it um, and also thought how that transition from the sort of motion, motion, motion to stillness worked for you. So beginning this book, I knew I wanted it to be um, immersive and also a, a tough book in the sense that homesteading is not easy. I think there's a mythology about homesteading that people knew what they were doing and um, went off to live off, you know, there's a mythology of, oh, they went to live off the land. And so I very purposely am writing against, I think, the mythology of Alaska as this idea of the last frontier, that it's an untouched, pristine wilderness when people have always lived there, Alaska natives have lived there for thousands of years, so that's one mythology I'm pushing against. And then I sort of sort of realized that there's another mythology about homesteading. And I don't, I really wanted people, I mean, even just building the cabin, how, I mean, I, I thought I thought of um, that I almost should have built my own cabin, that would have been easier than writing about building a cabin <laughs> because it <laughs> seemed so technical <laughs> at some point and I, to visualize it was a little difficult. but. 
with Marie, I wanted, there's a sense in the book from the very beginning, even in Lawrence's chapter, when he picks the land and he realizes there's a Nike missile site. And he said, I wanted to be away from everything. I can't believe there's something already out here. That for all, both of them, for all of their striving, that there would be hardship and that there would be um, things would not go their way as they both thought. So that was one way to sort of introduce these ideas that this is going to be a really, they, they don't know each other and what if they didn't know each other and this sort of, tra you know, this very traumatic and um, traumatic thing happened to their, to their marriage that early. So that was one idea about um, their marriage that if this happened early, the, the rest of the book would be reckoning with that. And I thought a lot about this idea of labor and women in labor in terms of writing about the wilderness. And so even, I mean, even today, the cabin at the homestead stands. It's a very large cabin. It's, you know, you look at it and you think this is a feat of strength and will and uh, skill. But um, when my grandmother was walking me around, I remember her showing me um, an old, I think, hand-cranked Maytag washing machine that she got some years later and just thinking about the time it would take to do laundry out there, the time it would take to cook meals, the time it would take to um, to get to work through your grief as a woman. So I was thinking about all the d different types of labor and women and labor. And so and also what came in too was other research about um, like maternity ward practices in the 50s. There's a ladies home journal called Cruelty and Maternity Wards that kept being referenced. So just thinking about all the ways in which women were, were dealing with hardship and how that was important to portray in the wilderness in Alaska alongside Lawrence's labor and to think about how labor was thought about and valued. Yeah, and I've, I promise to give away no more plot points, but there is both a plot and thematic question about the idea of claiming land and who can claim land. And I wondered if without talking about the specific shape of the plot here, you can talk a little bit about the, the research you did there and the, the sort of history that you borrowed from there and what was interesting to you about that sort of whole idea of what it takes to, to claim a piece of land and how that can become contested in various ways. Mm -hmm. Well, so one big plot point I'm not giving away anything. We all know Alaska became a state, but <laughs> that happens in the book. <laughs> that happens in the book, and that's sort of being talked about and how people are working towards that idea. And so I wanted to bring in different ideas of what statehood would mean for different people in Alaska. And so one perspective would be an Alaska Native perspective about what statehood would mean. Um, the federal government claimed, I think, I'm going to bring some numbers, 70 million acres first, um, and how much was homesteaded? I think three overall, 3,300 people filed for homesteads in Alaska, and I think it constitutes less than 350,000 acres, which is still, but in, a lot of acres. But in the term, and I, the idea of the federal government claiming all those millions of acres, it's a small amount, and then you have statehood coming and then there's going to be another land grab by the state. So that was really, that was something I didn't know that statehood meant that there would be another land grab for, for land under the jurisdiction of the state, gov state government. And then moving backwards, you have Alaska Natives have lived in Alaska thousands of years. The Russians claim, t came and claimed the land and then sold it to the U.S. and no one asked people who had always been there about it. So I wanted to bring in this idea when the characters in this later half in the book meet um, a historical figure named Shem Pete, who was a Denina elder and storyteller and historian who lived in Nancy Lake, which wasn't that far away, and he traveled widely, so it wasn't a stretch that they would meet him, to bring in these ideas of, there's, there's other ideas of statehood. There's been people who've lived here for generations and um, he speaks to Nina Athabaskan. He knows the different names of places that they know, such as Point Mackenzie, where they live. And I wanted that history to sort of challenge my characters because there is a sense of entitlement. There's a sense of this is going to be my land. And there's a history that they don't know, but they're learning as the book progresses. Yeah. And I, I know that 
as a writer who writes a lot about Alaska, we've we've talked about some less than great. We, we won't name any names, but some less than spectacular representations of Alaska, and and the ways in which you're sometimes writing against that are trying to complicate people's sense of what Alaska is. I wondered if you could talk about, as you were thinking about this book that's so much about place, what either fictional or historical or personal accounts you did draw on, or what kinds of things you were writing toward or against to, to complicate that picture of the state? Well, one is the family history of, there was a process of imagining my grandparents and that as fictional characters, and I think what really helped is changing the names slightly. So Lawrence Berenger has my grandfather's first name, a different last name that's a little similar, and then for the longest time I didn't know what Marie would be called, but I decided it's it's my middle name, it's my mother's middle name, it's my grandmother's sister's middle name, and sort of carrying on that through, and I changed Kathleen to Colleen. So that was the first process of changing the names and um, deciding that, okay, th this will be a fictional representation that sort of draws on the family history, but to, there are some things I just had to let go and let the fiction take over and figure out who, the, you know, who these people were in the book and leave the family history um, sort of hovering above the book at all times. And then, what's the second part of your question? Oh, whether there were any kind of fictional representations that sort of signaled, that were interesting to you to be in conversation with as opposed to in conversation against. There might not be. Oh. <laughs> they don't have to be. <laughs> well, so there were, there were just historical people that I brought into the book to sort of like have the history always being sort of pressing on my characters. And so the owners of the Lucky Wishbone are the actual owners. Walt Thielen did own the, the um, country store. Uh, again, I mentioned Shem Pete. He and his son, Billy, are in the book. So I'm treating them as historical figures. And um, Billy Holiday actually did the year we, a year or two before my characters get there, did visit Anchorage. And I wish I would have been able to include more, but I wanted, you know, to acknowledge her visit. And, but there's, I mean, again, I'm writing against, I think, this idea that it would be easy to be a, a lone person and go and homestead, I think, was very difficult. Yeah, and I think you really see that in the those times when the book moves between the homestead space and the more urban space where Sheila and Sly live. And just, I mean, it's not even that many people, right? But there's so many more people. And suddenly you see this sort of vibrant, vibrant community and they have to sort of go to another place to, to check in sometimes. And those are sometimes moments of comic relief in the book, sometimes moments of just kind of you learn something really interesting when you suddenly see how long they've been alone because there are other people around. And it sometimes changes a dynamic in their marriage a little bit just to have someone else comment on it, right? There's a scene where they go to a bar and someone wants to dance with Marie and it feels like it's maybe gonna go bad, but then it ends up like bringing them to like a little bit of a, of a closer place because they suddenly see each other from an external view and you realize how much of what's sort of exquisitely tense in the rest of it is that there's like nobody else there to provide that sort of external view of the, of the self or the couple. Um, and so I, I, I think that movement between isolation and space, as it, I enjoyed those moments a lot as a reader because I think it sort of heightened the, the ex excitement in different ways of both spaces. Um, as you were doing all this historical research, were there particular kinds of bars or stores that the, the sort of you just find yourself drawn to and thought I have to include that space because of what it meant to this community? Well, I've been to the Lucky Wishbone with my grandmother, my two aunts, my mom. Um, so that was in mind. And I think we, when we were there, George was sitting at the counter with a newspaper. And I didn't know who he was. And one of my uncles said, oh, that was George. That's one of the owners. That, you know, he's owned that since the early 50s. So that, I, I knew I had, you know, I had to include the Lucky Wishbone, which my grandmother wanted to go to. And... Um, so yeah, just, play, just oh, the statehood bonfire that happened in Anchorage. I watched a lot of footage. Um, we have some questions from the audience. Okay. I wonder where the birds are. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Reviewers have specifically praised your prose sentence by sentence. Tell us how you write a sentence, all at once or with many revisions. So I will tell you, I started writing pages for this book. I had start, tried to start a novel earlier, but the actual pages started in 2014, so it's been a very long process. And one thing is I have to have it very silent, and I have to be able to hear the rhythm of the sentences. So even God made the trees and men make the kindling, they say, I can almost scan it like poetry. I, I know there's a rhythm there. And so sometimes I'm just looking for the rhythm and thinking by ear and I'll read out loud over and over again. I also write by hand a lot in the beginning until I feel like I've settled into the voice and the rhythm. And um, I think this book in particular, the poetry comes from the landscape and the silences between Lawrence and Marie and then the dialogue is a chance that anytime someone speaks it has to be really good because <laughs> um, I feel like I've earned those moments when um, they're conversing. So the landscape and then because the chapters moved uh, forward each month, every chapter I was thinking what's happening with the stars, what's happening with the sky, the weather, all the plants, all the animals and I think that sort of lends itself to its own poetry, the poetry of a place. And um, I mean, there's a scene I love that I, I, I Marie hears a scream because foxes sound like they're screaming sometimes. And she goes outside and she sees that, I think it's called rust, the rust blown, you know, rust of their tails in the trees. And um, for me, I just, I love moments where I can sort of slow down. And it, the small moments are really important in this book because I think sometimes it feels like nothing happens, but everything happens. And just in my mind, the foxes, I was, those moments are sort of beauty or hard earned and worth it. And maybe it's small moments of grace as well in terms of this tumultuous marriage. Uh, the next question is, how do you research fiction? How do you decide what to invent or fabricate? It's a long process because like I said, I, I started this book with my grandparents in mind, and there's a lot of crossover, but there's something that happens, I think, when you lock in point of view and voice and present tense and the tense, that the fiction sort of has a mind of its, has a mind of its own. I think one of my professors, I, I remember Lucy Corrin used to say, the fiction is smarter than you are, and I've never forgotten that. That sometimes you have to like let go a little bit and let the sort of fiction take over. So it's as if I start with a kernel of truth, and then I have to let that kernel become a diamond through many years of compression. <laughs> uh, did you write any of Homestead in Alaska, or when you weren't there, how did you metaphorically transport yourself there? So. Um, I was in Alaska, I'm, I'm in Alaska a lot in the summers, and this, a couple, a year ago about, I was there in the fall, so I saw the trees turn. I'm always taking notes um, where, whenever I'm there. I'm usually there in the summers, but I was taking notes, and I have been in winter, and even where I was living at the time in Denver, I was taking notes about the snow but um, like one detail about the trees that stuck with me when I was there um, through October was I expected the trees, when they turn color, to be all different colors, but there's really only one color, and it's like gold kind of green color, and um, just because it's the one tree that's turning. And um, so I'm, always, I'm just always taking notes. I do get up there a lot, um, but also I can always, there's so many family members up there, I can call and I say, there were a couple times I said, can you just look out your window <laughs> and tell me what's happening with the ice or, you know, is it melting right now? And, you know, I can do that as well. So that was very helpful. Uh, this question says, nice boots, great taste, <laughs> commenter. Um, was there a piece of research at New York Public Library that altered your plans for this book? So when I was at the library, I was actually trying, I was doing very different research and writing this book, but um, I did find, 
someone mentioned the Foxfire manuals that for people who were building cabins, I think in the 60s and 70s. And, the, and so I w that, that was a really good find. That was Beth McCabe who said, you should look at, I was talking to her about the tech, technical details about building a cabin. Um, but also I could call my dad a lot <laughs> about all the, so he's an engineer, all the sort of technical details about tools and wood. Um, so I was simultaneously trying to write, and I was, I'm a very slow writer doing that, and I was actually researching um, different aspects of Alaska history at the same time. So it was, it was kind of split in the middle. Um, this question is, can you talk about writing fiction with a political message, or how you think about the politics of your own fiction? Those moments were the sort of the research that really surprised me that I knew to be sort of true to the historical aspects of the book even though it's fiction and I could, you know, you can do what you want <laughs> sometimes. Um, so I, I sort of focus on what I can do um, through my characters. And like you mentioned, anytime they go to Anchorage, I want them to see something interesting, um, see people they haven't seen before, hear about the s s politics of statehood, impending statehood, and the petitions for statehood. So all those things are... But I, I really try, if I think like, oh, this book is going to, if I start with a big idea, it doesn't work for me. I have to start with the everyday. Uh, this question says, Melinda, are you more happy or more sad that you're done writing this book? It also says, thanks for a great talk. There's also an emoji. <laughs> I think I'm just so relieved to have finished a book. Uh, my first book came out in 2011. And I've just had so much support from fellowships like the Coleman, um, just great friendships and um, of other you know, fellow writers and just so many people believing in me. I remember my agent Bill read some of the first pages and he was the one that told me it had to be in present tense. And I was like, no, please <laughs> don't tell me it has, this whole novel is gonna be in present tense. But he was right, the everydayness, the just struggle, the everyday struggle of trying to be a homesteader worked. And so I'm in celebrate, celebratory mode, I think, finally. Well deserved. Um, <laughs> do I have time to ask a question? We have one more question, but can I ask a question about present tense? Because we, we skipped over it earlier. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> well, because I'm, I, I'm really interested in, because I think that- Don't do it. <laughs> But I think the thing that's interesting about present tense is that the way that you're using it, it feels kind of really singular to me. Like I feel like, or maybe because it's doing lots of different things that present tense does. Because I feel like one thing present tense does is say, these people are in a story, but they don't know what the story is yet. So it's, it's like the character's consciousness is not intentionally shaping the story into a story. The writer has to do that, but the characters don't know. Another thing present tense can do is like fix a place and a point of time to say like, this is the moment I would like to return to and so I'm gonna keep trying to make the story return there even though time keeps passing. Another thing present tense can do is say like, this is the place where the trauma happened and so it's always gonna keep happening. And I feel like often when you see present tense, it's doing like one of those three modes really well, but I feel like somehow the present tense here is doing all three of those modes really well. Um, and so I wondered like, did you have an operative sense of like what present tense was doing for the book for you? I wish I could say I did. I felt, for, for many years I felt I was writing in a dark tunnel but one of the sort of keen pleasures of this book was thinking that at some point it had its own memory and it was accumulating and the memory was accumulating in terms of the land and the marriage between the characters. And so, you know, fireweed comes up every August and that resonance of the memory imbued of the last time fireweed came and how that built and that recall when I, could get, when I get, could get to moments like that, I thought, oh, I can do this. And I feel as though present tense lent, it, like you said, lent itself to all those, all those things. But when I look at the book as a whole, um, there's a chapter called Almanac, which I don't think is, uh, which I think is very intentional. I mean, I think I was thinking at some point that this book it's sort of an almanac for a marriage, for the psychological and emotional ties to a landscape. And it's, it's very cyclical in that way. And 
but yeah, that the book was creating its own memory and that I could recall things. And I remember distinctly, I was working on some later chapters and I was driving home and I turned and the moon was in the sky and it was full. And then a cloud passed over it and it looked like a veil. And I stopped and I said, that's how I'm going, I need to add that to one of these later chapters. Again, thinking about that burnt veil and the veil comes up again. And so just moments like that, that I, I don't even know if readers will notice them like I do because I wrote it, but I think that the emotional resonance underpinning that section is, I don't know, I felt, yeah. I just felt so excited about moments like that. Fabulous, thank you. We have one last question from the audience. Um, loved hearing you two rejoice in each other's writing. Who else are you reading and loving? And what books have been inspiration for your respective projects? So this book in particular, I thought a lot about Lila by Marilyn Robinson because it's about a young woman sort of wandering who has a difficult childhood and is looking for a home. And um, when I read that book, it, it just has stayed with me. And so that definitely was a book um, that I thought a lot about. I'm, I'm trying to, I couldn't read for a long time while I was finishing the last couple of years of finishing this book, I read your book. I kind of forced you to read my book. <laughs> I, I, I made I all of, it was during my book came out in the middle of Zoom, and I was like, "How do I pretend I have human contact?" So we had a book lunch with like ten people at it. But yeah. so you were kind of forced to read my book yeah. by virtue of being one of my favorite short story writers <laughs> and coming to my short story book birthday party. Right. <laughs> I thought a lot about Annie Prue's uh, Wyoming stories. I read those some years ago, but the way that nature is so brutal to whoever, not to men and women alike in the book. It doesn't matter who you are, that nature doesn't sort of let you off the hook. I thought a lot about that book. Um, and then, yeah, those, those are the main two I, ha I think I had in mind. And then, I, you know, again, I had like the family stories I was sort of wrestling with. Um, I'm currently reading, um, some um, other Alaska writers. I wanted, I wanted to catch up books I've been hearing about. So there's a, nov um, a memoir called the, T the Tao of Raven, an Alaska native memoir by Ernestine Shankashok Hayes. Um, I'm reading, and I've just bought um, some other Alaska writer books. So I'm kind of trying to catch up. And um, I feel like I've been in a cave writing this novel for many years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, I feel like all the books I've been reading lately are things I'm blurbing and I always feel like there's a band, you don't know them when I'm like mentioning a book <laughs> that you can't read yet. Um, but I, I was reading a, a lot of omniscient novels because I was trying to work on an omniscient voice. Um, and they're all great. Like I reread Jazz and Mrs. Dalloway and um, Sister Carrie and, um, and uh, Donnie Walton's Final Arrival of Opal Nev, which is not quite omniscient, but I was thinking of like different kinds of omniscience and collage. Mm -hmm. Um, and they were all beautiful, but it was like, ended up just making my narrator a sort of first person omniscient alleged psychic, because that <laughs> felt easier <laughs> than trying to understand how to write omniscience. Um, all right, well, um, thank you all for coming out and for those wonderful audience questions. Melinda, thank you so much for this book, for this conversation, for, for being you. Um, I know you have friends and family here, who some of whom come a long way to, to celebrate this with you. Is there anything you'd like to say? Before we leave. Sure. I just <laughs> want to thank, I have two aunts here from Alaska. My parents and my sister came from California. Friends that I know, also Lynn and other F Coleman fellows. But I um, just want to give a shout out to Lynn. When we were fellows, we had offices right next to each other in a corner. And every Monday, I said, do you want to have a, like, a little meeting with our coffee and talk about what you want to get done for the week? And then we would meet every day and say w what we wanted to get done, and we still do Monday check-ins all these years later. So, <laughs> that's all I'm